Hello everyone and on behalf of ANROSE I welcome you to today's webinar New Survey Questions and New Evidence What does the 2021 National Community Attitudes Towards Violence Against Women Survey tell us? My name is Padma Raman and I'm the CEO of ANROSE. Before we begin I'd like to acknowledge um, the traditional owners of the country on which we meet today I'm coming to you from the beautiful lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And on behalf of ANROSE, I pay deep respects and celebrate elders past and present. Wherever we are today, we are on unceded Aboriginal land. And I'd like to acknowledge and pay respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us on the webinar today. Before we start the discussion, I'd like to share some housekeeping information. Up first is a presentation by Dr. Nicole Wicks, who will share the key findings of the 2021 NCAS. Following the presentation, we'll have a panel discussion followed by a live Q&A. Please send through your questions at any time during the discussion and the panel will try and answer as many as they can. And I'll try and get to as many questions as you um, put up there. The research report and resources of, uh, related to today's uh, webinar are available in the handout section of GoToWebinar on the right hand side of your screen. If you'd like to access closed captions, please click on the link provided in the chat. The webinar will be recorded and will be available on the, on the ANROSE website as soon as possible. You can subscribe to our e-newsletter to learn when that, that will be published. Finally, we have a survey that will pop up as you exit the webinar. If you could take a couple of minutes to complete it, we'd really appreciate it. Your feedback um, helps us improve our program. It is important to take care of yourself while watching this webinar. If you'd like to access support, please contact 1800 RESPECT on 1800 737 732 or Lifeline on 131114. The 2021 NCAS report was published by ANROSE last week. And I'd like to congratulate our Director of Research, NCAS, Dr. Christine Kumralaris, and her wonderful team for their extraordinary work. NCAS is the world's longest running survey of community attitudes towards violence against women and gender inequality. This report is a critical piece of architecture for the national plan. In fact, a lot of um, what the NCAS provides us um, feeds into the direction of the new national plan to end violence against women and children. The survey measures how well Australians understand violence against women, how much they support gender equality, how strongly they condone or reject violence against women, whether this has changed over time, and their intentions to intervene when witnessing abuse or disrespect towards women. Today, you will hear about how the survey included new and revised questions about demographic items, intersectional forms of oppression, and key and emerging forms of violence. This new evidence provides a picture of where Australians are in their understandings of and attitudes towards violence against women. It also highlights what we have to work towards to ensure that everyone in the community has advanced and understandings and attitudes regarding violence against women. I'd like to now introduce you to our presenters, Dr. Nicole Weeks, NCAS Manager at ANROSE, Eloise Laird, Manager LGBTQ Plus Health Programs, Community Health at ACON, Carolyn Wilkes, um, Manager, Women's Programs, Education, Prevention and Inclusion Branch at eSafety Commission. And Kristen Diemer, Associate Professor, University of Melbourne. The 2021 NCAS report included new and revised survey questions. Nikki, can you tell us more about the key findings? What's new about the study in regard to demographic items? Thank you, Padma. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll just pull up the slides. Um, so I'll start with a brief summary of our methodology and what's new. So we asked 19,100 Australians aged 16 and over questions about their understanding and attitudes and demographic characteristics. 
New and revised items were included in 2021 on gender, sexuality and disability to provide additional and more inclusive demographic information. These items were drafted in consultation with the NCAS advisory group and other stakeholders, including relevant government and advocacy groups. The 2021 NCAS incorporated demographic items from the ABS standard for sex, gender, variations of sex characteristics and sexual orientation variables 2020, making it the first large scale data collection with a representative sample of the Australian population to implement this standard. This included separate questions about sex as recorded on their birth certificate and gender identity, including response options for non-binary identity or another term. The 2017 item on disability was amended to better capture the range of disabilities and long-term health conditions. The 2021 NCAS also included new items on types of violence against women that are related to intersectional forms of oppression. We examined violence against women that targets a partner's identity or experience, such as their migration or disability status, their gender experience, sexuality or religion. In recognition of the ever-evolving expression of violence against women, in 2021, we also included more items on technology facilitated abuse, sexual harassment and stalking to allow more detailed reporting on these. The addition of these new items allowed us to develop psychometrically validated scales for technology facilitated abuse and sexual harassment in addition to the scales included in 2017 on domestic violence and sexual assault. There were also some changes made to the main scales. These changes were made with caution to ensure the scales were comparable over time. So for more details on the methodology, you can see chapter two of the report and the technical report. So let's present some of the results. In 2021, while respondents had a high awareness that violence against women is a national problem, their awareness that it happens anywhere, including their local suburb, was much lower. As you can see, 91% of respondents agreed, either somewhat or strongly, that violence against women is a problem in Australia. However, less than half of the respondents, 47%, agreed that violence against women is a problem in the suburb or town where they live. This suggests a misconception that violence tends to occur generally outside our own networks rather than everywhere which may impede recognition that violence is a community-wide problem requiring action at all levels of society. It's also notable that two in five respondents indicated that they would not know where to go if they needed outside support for someone experiencing domestic violence. This finding highlights the need to continue to focus on community education and empowerment, to assist people to correctly identify domestic violence and to provide them with the capabilities to seek support as a victim or survivor, as a family member, friend or bystander, and for perpetrators to find support in changing their behaviour. So the NCAS has been a key means of monitoring progress against the 2010 National Plan and will continue to examine progress against the current National Plan to End Violence Against Women and Children. The NCAS has three main scales, Understanding of Violence Against Women or UVORS, Attitudes towards gender inequality or ages, the at and attitudes to against the, towards violence against women or AVORS. To progress towards ending violence against women, we want higher scores on all three scales, indicating better understanding or stronger rejection of problematic attitudes. Overall, understanding and attitudes improved significantly over time. As you can see from the grey and yellow lines, there's been a significant incre increase in understanding of violence against women and rejection of gender inequality in 2021 compared to 2009, 2013 and 2017. The brown line shows that while rejection of violence against women has improved since 2009 and 2013, there was no significant change between 2017 and 2021. The attitudes towards violence against women scale is made up largely of attitudes towards domestic violence and attitudes towards sexual, sexual violence. I'll introduce them next. So this figure presents the type of violence scales, the domestic violence scale, sexual violence scale and technology facilitated abuse scale. 
As you can see, all three scales were largely on par in 2021, suggesting understanding of and attitudes towards each type of violence were similar. The technology facilitated abuse scale is new in 2021. You can see from the green line that rejection of domestic violence has increased since 2009 and 2013, but then plateaued since 2017, similar to the pattern we saw for attitudes towards violence against women overall, of which this, this, is a, this scale is part of that. Positively, we have seen an increase in rejection of sexual violence from 2017 to 2021. For more information on change over time, you can see chapter three, and for a chapter dedicated to the various types of violence, you can see chapter seven. Now let's have a look at different ways to understand our progress. So scale scores tell us that there has been improvement, which is wonderful, but they don't tell us if, prog if the progress we've made is good enough. To measure this, we use scale scores to establish an aspirational goal for the community categorising more progressive responses as advanced and other responses as developing. So this figure shows the percentage of respondents who reached this aspirational level on each of the scales, demonstrating advanced understanding or rejection of problematic attitudes. Given that we did not reach this aspirational level for even half of the respondents on any scale, it's clear that there's still substantial work to be done to improve community understanding and attitudes regarding violence against women and gender inequality. You can see more detail on this and change over time in chapter three. Now let's take a look at gender differences. So moving to the next slide. Um, this shows that gender differences on each of the three main scales. Keep in mind that gender explained at most 5% of the differences in understanding and attitudes. So a lot of our understanding and attitudes are better explained by factors other than our gender identity, and in fact, other than our demographic characteristics themselves. In regards to understanding, half of the women and non-binary respondents had advanced understanding of violence against women compared to 38% of men. Gender differences were most pronounced for attitudes towards gender inequality. Non-binary respondents demonstrated the strongest rejection of gender inequality, with more than half demonstrating advanced rejection of gender inequality. This was significantly more than the 35% of women, which was significantly more again than the 21% of men in the advanced category. Finally, for attitudes towards violence against women, non-binary respondents and women demonstrated more advanced rejection of violence against women than men. So what these results tell us is that non-binary people and women do tend to have better understanding and rejection of gender inequality and violence than men do. However, all genders have plenty of room for improvement on understanding and attitudes. Violence against women and the problematic attitudes that underpin it is not something we can address by targeting a single gender. There's more detail on demographic factors, including gender, in Chapter 9. So I'll just briefly summarise what the main scales found. The NCAS highlighted the progress, but also the gaps in understanding of violence against women. Community understanding of violence against women has continued to improve, as we showed earlier. For example, since 2017, there's been significant improvement in recognition of violence against women and domestic violence, including in-person and electronic stalking, harassment via emails, text messages, etc., and financial abuse. However, there are gaps too, such as recognising that violence against women affects all parts of our community, recognising that non-physical forms of violence count as violence, that exploiting aspects of a partner's identity or experience, such as a chronic health condition, also counts as violence. Other gaps include knowing where to go to seek help for a domestic situation and recognising the gendered nature of domestic violence, with two in five people thinking that men and women equally perpetrate violent violence, despite evidence that the vast majority of domestic violence is perpetrated by men. Details on community understanding are included in Chapter 4. In terms of insights regarding attitudes, further intervention is necessary to address the harmful attitudes still held by a minority of Australians. For example, we need to challenge attitudes that reinforce gender inequality, such as those 
that reinforce traditional rigid gender roles and expectations, those that undermine women's leadership and work in public life, that limit women's personal autonomy, that downplay or normalise sexism, and that deny that gender inequality is experienced by women. See Chapter 5 for more details about attitudes towards gender inequality. In addition, in Chapter 6 you'll find problematic attitudes that perpetuate violence against women. Again, a minority of people tend to agree with these, including attitudes that minimise the seriousness of violence against women and shift blame from perpetrators to victims and survivors, attitudes that mistrust women's reports of violence, and attitudes that objectify women or disregard the need to gain their consent. It's important to continue to challenge biases, myths and misconceptions regarding violence against women and gender inequality because these biases reflect the societal culture, including broad practices, processes, systems and structures that maintain gender inequality and violence against women. In addition, it's important to assist the community to identify problematic attitudes, both in themselves and in their immediate network, and to speak out when they witness disrespect against women, including against seemingly benign behaviours such as sexist jokes. The hope is that we can create a community where disrespect or violence towards any gender is intolerable. So in 2021, we also looked at respondents' intention to intervene when witnessing abuse or disrespect towards women. We asked respondents about three scenarios, where a close work friend told a sexist joke, where a boss told a sexist joke, or where a friend verbally abused his partner. To summarise, we found that most people would be bothered by these scenarios and say that they would intervene then and there or in private later. However, results were highly context dependent, with more people bothered by verbal abuse than sexist jokes, more people bothered by a boss telling a sexist joke than by a friend, and fewer people willing to say anything if a boss told a sexist joke than if a friend did. Overall, these results indicate that most Australians say they would call out disrespect, which is really wonderful, but show that this is heavily context dependent, with more work needed to highlight that comments that are just jokes can still be harmful and should be called out. This is especially important in men-dominated contexts where disrespect towards women is most likely to be normalised, and where in our results, more than half of the men say they would not be bothered if a friend told a sexist joke. You can find more details on bystander results in Chapter 8, and I'll hand back over to Padma. Thanks so much, Nikki. There's so much to unpack there. Um, but starting with um, the new additions to um, demographics, as we've heard, the survey results are reported by gender, not by sex assigned at birth. Eloise, I might go to you and ask, what does this mean for gender diverse people? Absolutely. Thanks, Padma. Look, I, I think as a first step, what it means is a less uncomfortable survey experience for trans participants. I've heard from many trans people in my life that questions about gender are often asked quite poorly and they haven't always known how they'd be counted or how to answer. So, you know, it's meant, for example, that non-binary people don't have to choose whether to misgender themselves to take part or just not take part at all. So those are some of those like smaller decisions that happen all the time for trans people in particular. So it's really, really great to see us embracing that ABS standard. It also gives us really much stronger data. Those improvements help us know who we're speaking to and they help us, I guess, to have capacity to understand the ways in which people with a trans experience may have attitudes and knowledges that differ from cis peoples and indeed I think you know that's played out in what we've seen. So as uh, Nikki kind of outlaid in 2021 the NCAS results are reported for three categories of gender men, women and non-binary people. And in the future, I would personally love to see the numbers of trans men and women go to the point where we can also have a look at, the, at their attitudes compared to cis men and women's experiences to see, you know, what are those differences in terms of gender experience? I think that actually be some really interesting benefits to oversampling our LGBTQ communities to kind of strengthen that data and get some of those insights, or even be looking at options for including um, binary and non-binary trans people in the one category for reporting separately, which isn't perfect, but such as when we've got small numbers of community members you know we've got to get creative but yeah overall really really exciting to see just in terms of the strength of the data and the experience for participants yes as you said the uh, uh, the results show that non-binary people have advanced attitudinal rejection of violence against women in most categories 
Does this mean we've got it all sorted? And I guess um, also what needs do non-binary people have going forward to support mm. their recognition of abusive relationships in their own relationships? Thanks, Pamela. Look, I think, you know, we're all impacted by the attitudes that we're surrounded by. So unfortunately, I don't think we can quite say that all non-binary people have this sorted. You know, when we look at the fact that 56% of non-binary respondents were categorised as having that advanced rejection of gender inequality, that means that 44% um, aren't quite there yet. But I have to say those positive results don't surprise me. We know that many trans people, including non-binary people, spend a lot of time thinking about and questioning gender and what it means for them, you know, the messages we receive and how they want to interact with gender, as many cis people do as well, of course. But that questioning puts people in a really great position to question those messages that we're getting about rigid gender norms and which we know drive violence. As well as that, sadly, what little research we do have about experiences of violence for LGBTQ communities tells us that non-binary people experience high rates of intimate partner sexual and family violence. And so it stands to reasons that survivors of violence are more likely to reject violence. I, I note as well that some of those uh, items on the scale don't ask about violence perpetrated against non-binary people and there's sort of a limited number of questions about other trans people. Mm -hmm. So there's still a number of survey questions which are themselves kind of binary and make it a little bit tricky to sort of measure how much non-binary people might recognise problematic behaviours in those sort of non-hetero and non-cis normative relationships. And I want to pause there to acknowledge that it makes a lot of sense that the NCAS is binary because so much of the gendered violence that occurs against women and LGBTQ plus people of all genders is a result of those rigid binaries. So we kind of have to measure how much people are subscribing to them and I would never say that we shouldn't. So I want to be really, really clear there. We also can't forget that non-binary people and other LGBTQ people often are experiencing gender-based violence from cisgender heterosexual men, not just from within community. In a recent sexual violence report that ACON published, 82% of trans um, non-binary survivors of sexual violence indicated that the perpetrator of their most impactful experience of sexual violence was cis man. So it's definitely appropriate to be having binary questions and it can sometimes limit some of our knowledges. So look, ultimately I'm really greedy and I'd love to see uh, even more measures of acceptance of violence against LGBTQ people and of community agreement with attitudes that are reflective of cisgenderism and heteronormativity. Um, but overall, I'd say, you know, non-binary people are often able to recognise abusive behaviours and, and where there's maybe more support needed is where to from here? Where are the support services that can provide affirming and safe support to non-binary people and binary trans people as well? Where are the family and friends understanding of that violence sitting? How able are those family and friends there to support? What are the healthy relationships models that people see that let them know they have a right to safety? And we know as well that trans people are less likely to be reporting to police and accessing criminal justice pathways. So I think that that as well as that attitude is really an area to strengthen. But overall, it's a really exciting first step, including non-binary people in this kind of research. And I think there's a lot more we can do to bolster it as well. Thanks. Great. Uh, Kristen or Carolyn, would you like to comment on that? Kristen, you've been involved in waves of NCAS. Yeah. Um, so yeah. it'd be interesting to get your views. Sure. So just my only comment would be that this is a really helpful step forward in thinking about how we undertake more gendered inclusive studies on interpersonal violence. You know, historically, there have been requests for this data, and this is the first time we've seen it reported in a meaningful way. Um, so, uh, you know, cheers to the team for that. Um, and I just echo um, Eloise's comments, you know, without getting ahead of ourselves, it suggests consideration of ways to meaningfully measure attitudes and understanding of violence against non-binary people to just extend some of the questions or components in future surveys. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, we've seen that this um, NCAS included new questions, including um, new questions around technology facilitated abuse. Nikki, can you just tell us a little bit more about um, the additional questions and what, what we found? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we included more technology facilitated items in 2021, enough to make a small scale with six items, two attitude items and four understanding items. So here on the screen, you can see the understanding items of the TFAS, the Technology Facilitated Abuse Scale. And as you can see, about eight in 10 people recognise these actions as violence against women or domestic violence. However, there remains a minority of the population who do not. The first two of the, these items are new in 2021. 
The second two were also asked in 2017 and have significantly improved since then, which is great to see. In 2021, 84% of respondents recognised harassment via repeated emails, text messages, etc., as violence against women, which is an improvement on 76% in 2017 and 71% in 2013. Similarly, in 2021, 83% of respondents recognised keeping track of a partner on electronic devices without their consent as a form of domestic violence, which is an improvement on 74% in 2017. So the next ones are the um, technology facilitated abuse scale attitude questions. So even though the majority of people disagreed with these statements, I find the proportion that agree really concerning. The first item is new in 2021, and I find it really concerning that 7% of the Australian population think that if a woman meets up with a man she met on a mobile dating app, then she's partly responsible if he rapes her. That's horrendous. Um, the second one here has improved since 2017, but it's still not great. In 2021, 77% of people disagreed that the woman is partly to blame if she shares, if her partner shares a naked picture of her without her consent. So this is an improvement on 2017 when 67% of people disagreed, but it's still really concerning that in 2021, just over one in five people agree that the woman was partly responsible in this situation even though it was the man who chose to share the intimate image. Another question that was not included in the scale, but is relevant here, was people were asked whether sharing a sexual picture of an ex-partner on social media without their consent is a criminal offence. One in 10 people did not realise that it was. So overall, most people do recognise technology facilitated abuse and do not hold attitudes that blame the victim for experiencing it. However, there's still a concerning minority that discount technology facilitated abuse is not really violence and a portion blame to the victim for experiencing it. Thank you. Carolyn, what, what, what do those findings say to you and how would this shape, um, how, how might those findings shape the work of the eSafety Commission? Okay, thanks. Thank you, Padma. I think first it was great to see the TFA scale introduced for the first time. It provides another great way for us to understand the factors influence, influencing the perpetration of the tech facilitated abuse. And second, considering this is the first time that Australia's communities understanding of and attitudes about tech facilitated abuse have been specifically measured through the survey, I think it is promising to see that similar rates of Australians understand and reject the use of TFA compared to other forms of violence. And it is encouraging to see a significant improvement in understanding of tech facilitated abuse based on those items that were in both 2017 and 2021 surveys. So while there's, it's clearly work to do to increase levels of awareness of tech facilitated gender-based violence, the survey shows that there is a baseline understanding that this is violence, it has serious impacts for victim survivors, and it's not acceptable. Um, and overall, the NCAS findings reinforce the importance and relevance of the work of eSafety and our partners. The eSafety Women team that I'm a part of was created in 2016 to raise awareness of tech facilitated abuse and assist frontline workers to provide their clients with appropriate support pathways, particularly in domestic and family violence contexts. And we offer web-based resources and professional development training face-to-face, -face, virtual and via an online learning system to help individuals and workforces recognise and respond to tech facilitated abuse. We also now oversee a number of other programs, policy and stakeholder engagement measures to address and prevent technology facilitated gender-based violence in all its forms. And those programs are there to support all women and, women and girls, while also providing tailored programs for cohorts who are at increased risk of online harm and tech abuse due to intersectional factors. And there's also the work of the rest of eSafety um, in education, regulation and reporting schemes. But the survey's identification of, of the continuing myths and misconceptions can guide us to where eSafety can strengthen and update the messages and information in our existing training, resources and media, and take every opportunity to push back on beliefs and attitudes that promote gender inequality. 
For example, we're asked to deliver training virtual and face-to-face -face across Australia. And these findings show the importance of our team using local family and domestic and violence statistics where available to help our audiences understand that gender-based violence is not restricted to certain regions or community groups. We can also ensure we're sharing the personal safety survey data and other relevant national statistics on family, domestic and sexual violence to deliver that evidence that men are the majority of the perpetrators, whether the victims are women, children, other men or non-binary people. When it comes to specific types of tech facilitated abuse, um, I think as Nikki noted, it's concerning that 21% of respondents agree that if a woman, woman sends a naked picture to a partner, then she's partly responsible if he shares it without permission. I mean, it's just a variant on she was asking for it and shows how quickly condoning can slip into victim blaming. But what our research and the reports of image-based abuse we receive show is that women are targeted for image-based abuse. Women are twice as likely as men to have their nudes or sexual image shared without their consent and are more likely to experience this from a current or former partner, someone they know and trusted. The mistrusting of women's reports of violence also has implications for us as a regulatory and reporting body and our associated work, particularly as public conversations continue around app dating violence. It's alarming that only 53% of respondents strongly disagreed with the statement that many allegations of sexual assault made by women are false, and only 44% disagreed with the statement that women who said they'd been raped had in fact led men on and then had regrets. Victim survivors should always be believed and supported to seek help, and the eSafety can receive reports and investigate multiple forms of online harm, including acts of adult cyber abuse and image-based abuse. But it's the newest of our initiatives announced just this morning by Minister Rowland and our Commissioner Julie Inman Grant that we hope can be one of our major con contributions to changing community attitudes. And the aim of the Preventing Tech-Based Abuse of Women Grants Program is to fund community-based primary prevention projects that will improve community awareness of the individual and collective impact of tech facilitated abuse and shift attitudes and norms to stop it before it starts. We've got a lot of work to do as a community to challenge and replace the attitudes that perpetuate violence against women. Um, and that's why the grants program guidelines direct potential applicants to develop projects that explicitly address the drivers of gender-based violence in relation to tech facilitated abuse. Those, the program guidelines became available today and the first round will open on the 18th of April with applicants have until the 29th of May to submit their application. And the objectives of the program are to increase public awareness about the prevalence and impact of tech abuse, support initiatives that address the drivers of tech-based abuse, challenge and shift the prevailing social norms, and promote positive and respectful behaviour and accountability in men and boys that perpetrate or may perpetrate tech-facilitated gender-based violence. And we look forward to seeing what our communities can come up with and how we can work with them. I'll go back to you. It's really exciting to um, have that announced today. And um, Eloise, I was just thinking about what we've seen in the last little while, which is a real increase in tech facilitated abuse of non-binary, especially trans communities. Um, would you like to comment on the use of technology to uh, yeah. perpetrate this form of abuse? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we know that LGBTQ plus communities and in particular trans people do experience tech facilitated abuse. And we're actually seeing even at ACON, um, a lot of that abuse at the organisational level of anti-trans lobbyists actually begrade brigading our trans affirming posts and really spreading hate, misinformation, and particularly around posts about trans women. So that's not necessarily on that intimate partner level, but it's, it's coming through very, very strongly. And we're also seeing that a lot of those people that are coming in to do that seem to be coming from actually outside of Australia. It's a very coordinated international effort, um, and which is really quite frightening to see, uh, you know, the, really the equivalent to death threats being made on posts that are primary prevention posts in themselves. So that has been, I think, really challenging. And what it points to is the need for a really strong national response. And also to acknowledge that uh, when we're talking about the online space, that women and LGBTQ people are faced 
with abuse from people outside of this country. And so we need strategies to manage that and to join with the prevention and response efforts across the world. You know, ACON are doing some really great work with the eSafety Commission and I look forward to that continuing. I don't know, these are sort of the questions that, that you are working through at the, at the Commission as well. It's really exciting to hear um, about those new grads. I have to say I hadn't seen that announcement yet this morning, so I'm gonna go digging after this. But yeah, I think it's uh, just really important to, you know, Technology facilitated abuse runs from so many different types of behaviours and so we need to have really varied response and, you know, responses at that community and local level as well as the national ones I just spoke about. So really exciting to hear about those grants kind of empowering communities to do the work where they're at. Um, Great, thank you. We might just move on to the other new aspects of the NCAS, so the intersectional, um, the questions around intersectionality. Nikki, can you tell us, unpack that a little bit more for us? Yeah, sure. So the intersection of different structural inequalities such as sexism, ableism, racism, classism, queerphobia, transphobia and ageism can also produce unique forms of domestic violence and abuse for specific groups of women. For example, abusers can employ controlling tactics by exploiting or targeting aspects of their partner's identity or experience, such as their chronic health conditions or disabilities, gender and sexuality, religion and migration status. To recognise this, new items were introduced in 2021 in the UVOS Recognised DV subscale that sought to gauge the community's understanding of particular forms of domestic violence and abuse resulting from the intersection of multiple inequalities. So most respondents recognise that threatening or con controlling or neglecting a partner in ways that target an aspect of the partner's identity or experience are always forms of domestic violence, but they do, not, but they do tend to be less well recognised than other forms of domestic violence. And a concerning minority felt that these behaviours were not a form of domestic violence. So as you can see, six to eight percent of respondents felt that it did not count as domestic violence if a person repeatedly threatened to deport their partner on a temporary visa, threatened to put a partner with a disability into care or a home, or controlled them by refusing to assist with their care needs, forced a partner to hide that they are transgender or to stop practicing their religion. So while it's a small minority, it represents a lot of people, and so this is an area where more education is required. We also had items in our mistrust subscale in the AVORS, so this is talking about attitudes now, that examined if people felt some aspects of a woman's identity made her less trustworthy. While most people strongly disagreed with these statements, a minority still strongly or somewhat agreed with them with statements that mistrust a woman, a woman based on aspects of her identity. So as you can see, the majority of respondents, around nine in 10, disagreed that les lesbian or bisexual women's reports of violence shouldn't be taken too seriously, or that women with mental health issues lie about sexual assault. However, concerningly, three to 6% did agree with these statements. Thank you. Great. Um, I might start with you again, Eloise. What do you think these um, What do you think these new findings tell us? Yeah. Look, I, I think these results really affirm what we have been hearing from our communities for quite some time about poor responses and recognition of violence they face from others in broader communities. And in fact, I'd say some of those experiences are perhaps even poorer um, anecdotally than what we're seeing here. So I think what's really helpful is having this demonstrated in such a national and respected survey. So we'll really be able to use this in our advocacy and to reinforce the findings of other research and work we're doing with communities. And I'd personally love to see a breakdown of those really specific questions by gender and sexuality to kind of take some lessons about who in particular we really need to be working within our bystander work because we, we found in some of our other work there there is a real difference based on gender and sexuality with even within that lgbtq plus kind of community umbrella so as i said we're you know doing a lot of work in this space already around increasing understanding of community members about what intimate partner and family violence can look like and our website say it out loud which i think is in the chat is an example of that so it's so important that we're always doing intersectional work and reflecting the nature of the communities we all live in and the ways that attitudes are impacted not just by misogyny, but also ableism, racism, colonisation, cisgenderism and heteronormativity. So it's so exciting to see that start to be built out and reflected in the survey even stronger 
than it was before. I think it really highlights that the drivers of violence are gendered and that there's a lot we need to do in terms of prevention initiatives and working together for gender transformative work. Uh, Nick, you've done a really great job, I think, of explaining. I think I've got a bit of stat blindness sometimes where I see a 90 and I'm like, that means it's great. Uh, and I think, you know, bringing us back to sort of the fact that if there are even three people in a room of 100 that agree with a statement like that, there's probably a lot more people that aren't quite willing to say that they're fully in agreement because they know they're not supposed to, you know, that there is really a lot of work to do that those three people in a room of 100 or six people in a room of 100, that is going to make a massive difference to the safety of a, of a survivor because we know that the outsized impact that one negative can, response can have is so strong. So thank you so much for really highlighting and driving a bit deeper into those stats for us today. And Nikki, do we have the breakdowns that Eloise was looking for? Uh, so they're not in the report. I physically have them, <laughs> but they are not reported anywhere yet. So come and so, talk to us, Eloise. <laughs> yeah, we've definitely been getting a lot of requests and something we'll consider. Yeah, very keen to work with people. Kristen, do you have any insights into that, the new findings? Yeah, I think that, you know, when I've listened to people respond to these questions, what often happens is they come up with an example of a, you know, so they say, well, in most cases it's that, but there's this one example which I would question, or, I, or you know, what about this? And I think what it shows is that, you know, in a, I think, and I, I do a lot of work globally and particularly in the Asia Pacific region, and I think what it shows is that in Australia we're doing a good job in getting that general understanding and knowledge and awareness of what sexual and gender based violence looks like and when you get into situations that are more nuanced or they're not discussed as commonly then people start to think about exceptions or different scenarios or they, they need to think about it a bit more deeply so I think Australia's kind of ahead globally in terms of a more um, advanced discussion and understanding and I think these questions are really useful in pinpointing the areas in which we need to do more work um, so I think it's, uh, it's very helpful to have these in here so, you know, we can frame our messaging around this, we can show what these different intersectional um, situations and communities look like, what violence looks like across the community mm -hmm. more broadly. Yeah, thanks. All right. Carolyn, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I would just say, I suppose the findings there are, or the, uh, validating of the work that eSafety is, is doing or, or in, and trying to do. Um, last year, we launched the, the Learning Lounge, um, so the, which has a suite of resources designed with and for the LGBTIQ plus communities. And that was one where ACON is one of our partners. And that includes information and advice on a wide range of online and tech safety issues, including some that are more likely to be experienced by people who identify as LGBTQI plus. Um, we've also just last week launched um, new web pages and resources focused on the First Nations community um, and so encourage everybody to check that is out because they're wonderful um, and we've done quite a bit of work on um, with resources focused on frontline workers supporting women with intellectual disability um, in the context of domestic and family violence to ensure that frontline workers are across how that is experienced differently that tech facilitated abuse for women with disability um, and we're doing more work in that space as well so I think it just spurs us on to do more um, in, in that space but it feels like we're on the right track. Yeah I guess stepping back um, and I, you know I invite you all to jump in not at once but <laughs> um, what does this really I think about the NCAS providing um, great evidence for prevention work um, more broadly. Um, can you reflect on what we should be taking away from it, but both from a prevention point of view and any policy implications that there might be? Kristen, I might start with you. Just... Yeah, I think it's, it comes back to, I, I, it comes back a lot to that gender equality and what does gender equality look like in all forms and shapes of relationships. And that I think that that messaging is, is essential. The other element that 
um, I think comes up throughout the NCAS is the consent questions. And we haven't spent a lot of time talking about that, but this myths, disbeliefs and consent and, um, and how people can recognize that what they're doing is crossing a boundary of someone else. And, you know, it could be used in a threatening way, but it can also be used in a manipulative way. So I think that those messages are really strongly needed in the prevention space. Thanks. Eloise, you have touched on this before, but... Uh, but you know I'll never stop look I think one of the really big parts of my work is articulating the ways that we really need to work together on shared goals to end violence articulating that actually the, those gender drivers of violence are shared and they're shared priorities and I think that this um, report is so great at reinforcing that it's really exciting to see that one of the implications named in the results regarding gender is that we can actually look to including non-binary people as allies in violence prevention. A particularly nasty form of transphobia we see is that our communities are actually positioned as being told, you know, that our rights, and particularly for trans women, that those rights are somehow in opposition to or damage the rights of cis -het women, which really could not be further from the truth. And this kinds of research, this kind of having these conversations together sends a really strong message that this isn't the case. So I think there's a lot of work both for ACON to do and other organisations like Anne Rose in terms of actioning these findings to look at how all people who experience gender-based violence, how we can do really targeted prevention work, look at where, you know, those are some really specific attitudes that we need to break down. Um, so it's, yeah, really part of, I think, improving the landscape for our community communities when it comes to attitudes, service access and recovery. Great, thank you. And again, Carolyn, you've talked about the work that the eSafety Commission is doing. Can you see um, potential for expanding on any of that around the prevention space, given the new findings? You're just on mute. Yes. I believe so. I think as I, yeah, we can improve and update our existing resources with the, with the new results. Um, I think there's important stuff, uh, important information there around um, bystander campaigns um, and that we can include in any further work we do in that space. And I think I mentioned with the grants program, and I think it'll be important for us using findings such as the NCAS to inform their work, whether it's about making sure that all applicants are aware of that, those findings to refine and improve the projects that they're developing. But also I think um, using the NCAS as a way to help inspire measurement of change in, in their projects and measuring changes in behaviours and attitudes. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I think the interesting thing about that grants program is, you know, the finding around it not being in my backyard, uh, yes. I think is a really interesting, that dissonance is really interesting. And maybe if we are uh, funding more place-based, um, community-based uh, primary prevention, people will have a better understanding that it in fact happens in our communities. And that this is something that I've, has come across in some of the media interviews I've been doing on NCAS, producers saying, oh, I didn't think I'd come across anyone um, who'd experienced violence, but I surely must have. Um, so it's that recognition that it's not just out there, but it's actually happening in our communities. I think, Kristen, you mentioned, and we haven't touched on this enough, I think the changes around sexual violence. So we have seen an improvement in understanding um, and attitudes of rejection towards sexual violence. And that's not surprising given the big conversations we've had uh, spurred on by Grace Tame and Brittany Higgins over the last few years. But I guess it's still concerning that such a significant proportion of people mistrust women's reporting of sexual assault, especially when we've got a criminal justice system that's based on juries. Um, it probably tells us why conviction rates are so low. But I just thought, Kristen, do you want to reflect on some of those um, findings around sexual violence? Yeah, sure. Um, it, it, I'm sort of uh, jumping a little bit into the PSS discussion. But, yes, um, and it would be great to do a bit of a comparison. <laughs> Um, so, you know, one of the questions in the NCAS asked, um, uh, so, uh, so I'm just trying to word it correctly, that um, about one in three Australians had a clear understanding that women are more likely to be raped by someone they know, and another third somewhat agreed. So that, you know, about 60% about mostly agreed that 
they're understood that people, women are more likely to be raped by someone they know, but you've got another third who disagree or are really unsure, so they think that it's more likely to be a stranger. And the personal safety survey, which is the actual prevalence rates of violence, it clearly dispels this sort of myth that only 6% of women experience sexual violence by a stranger. And in fact, one in five women experience sexual violence by a known person. So I think that's a, it's a good example of how we can use data from the prevalence surveys of the, pers the personal safety survey to dispel a lot of these myths that are still really um, uh, you know, broadly accepted in the community or people are really unsure because they're hearing a lot about um, stranger rape and that's what, they, that's what they believe in or they hear of one case of stranger rape so they think that that's all, that's what women greatly experience and then they're really quick to dispel any of the reports of um, sexual assault that women talk about you know with a known partner there's a, a lot of questioning about that um, and in fact if you look at the actual experience of stranger violence the majority of stranger violence is in fact physical violence by men against other men and that's one in five men um, so stranger violence is very rare for women do you want to do some of the other comparisons with the um, uh, PSS? Because one of the things I found really interesting is while the NCAS says, um, you know, 90% of people think stalking is bad, for example, we still have quite high rates of stalking. I think it's one in five for the PSS. So um, I think it's interesting to look at the comparison of attitudes and experience. So if you could draw some of those others, either Kristen or Nikki. Starting with Christian. Yeah. Start with me? Okay, sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't, in the audience, I don't know how familiar people are with the personal safety service. So I just wanted to give a little bit of an um, introduction to it, um, that it measures, you know, the types of violence. It, it's globally comparative in the way it measures physical and sexual violence, harassment and stalking. And then it looks at cohabiting partner violence and measures emotional abuse. And for the first time, we're measuring economic violence. Um, and the survey further measures experiences of violence as a child, including witnessing violence. Um, and I just wanted to explain how the questions are asked um, that in the PSS, we ask about specific acts of violence. Like for example, have you, ex have you ever experienced being hit, slapped, shoved, pushed? We, so that we have very um, similar or the same questions asked of everyone similar understandings of what violence is and then they're asked if you have experienced that who has perpetrated that against you and it could be anyone from a stranger to a sibling to a child to a partner and then that's how we work out who's experienced what form of violence and who's perpetrated that violence so that's a very quick introduction to that um, and then, and then, so then thinking about the actual experience of violence in the PSS, comparing and contrasting with the knowledge and understanding as illustrated in NCAS, um, the PSS shows strongly gendered patterns of violence, which are counter to a lot of the myths and disbelief that's been, that have been identified in the NCAS results. So, you know, firstly, the, the results of the personal safety survey show that if you group all types of violence together, that women and men experience violence in very similar proportions. About two out of every five women and two out of every five men experience violence in their lifetime, putting everything together. But when you break it down by the type of violence and the perpetrator, we see quite stark differences. Most of the violence experienced by men is physical, 40% or two in five men. And while most of the violence against women is also physical, it's only 30, it's smaller, it's 30%. And when you look at sexual violence, nearly a quarter of women report sexual violence compared to 6% of men. Now, the 6% is important, but when you're com comparing it, it's quite different. Um, women are far more likely to experience stalking, 20%. So one in five experience stalking, and 7% of men experience stalking. And when we look at intimate partner physical violence from an opposite gendered partner, including, it includes cohabiting as well as boyfriend, girlfriends. So a male experiencing partner violence from a female or a female experiencing partner violence from a male. It's one in five women and fewer than one in 10 men, only 6%. Mm -hmm. If you add in um, same sex or non-binary partners, it's one in, four, one, in, 
one in four women, 23%, but it's still less than one in 10 men, only 7%. So women are three to four times more likely to report violence by an, three more times more likely than opposite gender and um, four more times by a, um, in a partner relationship. Um, and when you look at the NCAS results, two out of five Australians believe that domestic violence is perpetrated equally by men and women. When in fact, you know, women are three times more likely to experience that domestic violence. Um, another myth that we can dispel with the personal safety survey is the mistrust of women's claims of abuse. And so that's one we just spoke about. But more than a third of Australians believe that women who are going through a child custody battle in court mm -hmm. make up or exaggerate claims of domestic violence. But in fact, we know that it's at least one in five women who have that experience. So it's, it's highly unlikely that it's being made up. And in fact, there's other data that shows that it's very rare to be making up that, that violence. Um, and maybe another one, another myth supported by nearly a quarter of Australians in the NCAS believe that women exaggerate the extent of men's violence against women. But in fact, one in three women report violence perpetrated by males, regardless of the type of violence. So it's a third of all women, so it's not an exaggeration. Um, and 15% believe that um, sexual assault's made up, but in reality it's one and a quarter. So I think that the two survey tools used together are really powerful to dispel the myths, and it's just the, the message we have to get out there. We have to dispel the myths, the mistrust, and the disbelief, and um, you know, putting them side by side it can do that. Yeah, thank and I you. guess putting them, thank you, and I guess putting them side by side also makes you recognize that if we don't have a good enough understanding of family and domestic violence, it might well be that women are underreporting um, both family violence and sexual violence. So, you know, there might be a little bit of caution around um, the numbers that the PSS um, is showing, especially because there was some work that Anne Rose did, um, commissioned um, Deb Loxton's uh, longitudinal health data set, uh, which showed that the levels of sexual violence anyway was much higher than the one in five in particular age groups. It found it as high as one in two in the uh, in women aged in their 20s. So um, yes, it's it's good to have this. It's good to have lots of data to be able to uh, uh, break those myths. Um, I'm hoping there's lots of questions in the chat box. Uh, please keep them coming if you haven't put them in yet. Um, someone should be sending me questions because I can't quite see the chat box and I've just got one. Um, so uh, I think the comparison between the NCAS and the PSS is super, super helpful in education and training. Will there be any formal connection reports, comparisons released? Well, that's telling us to do some work, isn't it, Nikki? We have started to draw um, some comparisons in, in, in the work that I've done, it, just in talking about the NCAS, but um, we'll definitely take that away and think about <clears throat> developing some fact sheets. And I think the way Kristen beautifully um, put the experience against the myths uh, might be something that we take away from this uh, webinar. And Carolyn, would you think of doing something with the NCAS that compares with the PSS around, I don't know that the PSS has a whole lot around technology facilitated abuse, but it does have stuff around stalking. Oh, sorry, Kristen. I could just add a little bit on that before Carolyn answers, um, because it does ask questions about tech facilitated abuse, but yeah. the way that the questions are, it's embedded within the emotional and sexual sexual, sexual yeah. violence and harassment. Um, and there will be something released later about different forms of violence in the year. Um, but they are, yeah, so there, there will be something that's not quite available just yet. I think I would just add, um, re reinforce what Kristen's already said, that the, the power of being able to show, to have the, the, the data from both alongside each other to demonstrate that disconnect um, between yeah, community attitudes and, and what's actually happening within our communities um, is important in our 
with our training, um, particularly when we're training sectors that aren't domestic violence specialist services, because for them it's probably not particular news. Um, but if we're training other frontline workers that uh, are less are not coming into contact with these issues all the time, I think it can be useful to help improve their responses and their, their willingness to be involved. Great. Um, I've got lots more questions coming through. The next one I can answer, are there stake break, breakdowns of the data available? Yes, and we will be releasing a jurisdictional report in um, hopefully sometime in May. Um, Nikki, this one's for you. Are we able to identify age demographics so that we can track any changes in generational attitudes? Yeah, absolutely. So at the end of, so we've got different um, chapters for each of the main scales. And in the main report at the end of those chapters, you can see what demographics, how much contribution each of the demographics has. Um, the age didn't have a huge contribution, similar to um, gender in terms of the percentage it explained wasn't wasn't that high. Um, we did tend to see, and this is talking off the top of my head, so it's better to go to the report. Um, but <laughs> um, but we did tend to see that younger people tended to have better attitudes. Um, and older people tended to have worse attitudes and people in the middle, there was no significant difference with the rest of Australians. Um, and so for more information on that, you've got a little bit at the end, in the main report at the end of each of those main chapters, the AVOR, like the UVORS, AGES and AVORS chapters. But there's also chapter nine, I believe, is on um, demographic characteristics and what what significant influences there were there. So that's where you'd go to find those. It's about yes, page so 235 for anyone looking. I spent a little bit of time on there prepping for this. An excellent section of the report. <laughs> and we also did a deep dive on young people's attitudes on the 2017 survey, which is worth looking at on our website. This is a nice question. Eloise, thank you for your wonderfully informative answers. What is the connection between people being sex and gender diverse and improved attitudes uh, and understanding towards gender inequality and violence? I think they want you to just talk about it more. Yeah, absolutely. Why not? And I promise I didn't plant that question. Um, look, I, I think it's, it's, it's complicated, right? And I think, you know, Nikki pointed out uh, really usefully that gender doesn't explain all the differences that we see. And, even I would need to talk to Nikki more about that to understand exactly how that works and how you work that out. I'm very impressed. Um, but, you know, I, I think what it tells us in terms of attitudes is, uh, you know, we all have differing understandings and amounts that we question gender and think about the messages we're receiving. And so in no means do I want to say that, you know, I'm a cis person myself, I've spent a fair bit of time thinking about gender. So there are absolutely cisgender people that are thinking a lot and questioning a lot about gender as well. But, you know, particularly uh, for trans people, there, there is absolutely a process of questioning um, gender, what gender messages you're receiving, which ones align with how you feel and which don't, discussions that you're having to have about gender with people when you're talking even just about who you are. Um, you know, it's a, it's a process and a, and a trickiness, I think, um, in our society where there is a lot of cisgenderism and really rigid gender norms. To have to push through those um, really requires, I think, quite a lot of critical thinking overall um, and this is kind of just you know my guess and feeling about it but I, I really think that that process really helps people to to be thinking about attitudes and so it's not a surprise to me that some of those myths or those really rigid understandings of what roles men and women should have um, that there's kind of differences there so I think probably a lot of that is what explains it um, and that, that might be a bit of why we're seeing it a little bit more for younger people as well um, you know, that kind of questioning is is really key. But I feel like I'm rambling a little bit there. Uh, but I think, you know, there's more work to do and more discussions to have. I also think, you know, marginalised communities show solidarity with other marginalised communities, um, may have experience of being part of those communities in other ways. And so there's also a really important and beautiful solidarity piece there that, you know, I think we can really continue to work on. Another beautifully informative answer. Um, Nikki, will there be a youth focus report released as it was for the 2017 data? 
this report is super useful for planning school-based programs and related to the above question on youth attitudes in previous editions of the NCAS there was a brilliant youth report which was much appreciated for further um, work and research I would love to know what we should expect any further analysis in particular regarding the new nuance um, of added intersectional understandings of violence coming in the future. So can you talk about our sub-reports? Yes, absolutely. So we are planning to release a youth report that is under development at the moment and will come out later this year. Um, we're also planning another sub-report um, as we did for the 2017 one as well for um, people from non-main English speaking backgrounds as well and a report on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples which might come out later this year or possibly even next year. And to that point Nikki, can you please comment on the data collected around Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women's experiences and how um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women have been engaged in the collection um, design and collection of those stats separately. I understand there'll be an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander specific report being released timeline and I think you've answered the question around timeline but um, I guess that uh, issue goes to data sovereignty and how, how we design and collect the information. Yeah absolutely and I, I think we, we want to make sure that that's all done to the best um, in, the, in the most appropriate way that it can be. Um, so we do have, we, we have a new module this year in the 2021, which is completely different from what was in the 2017, um, that was only asked of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Um, and that is exploring um, trust in um, like, uh, it's perceptions of how seriously violence is treated by various services including police and this sort of thing. So it's, it's really quite um, different from the, the main set of attitudes questions um, and sort of yeah just seeking information on um, yeah experience of these issues in those communities and that was developed in consultation with our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, consultation group um, and those questions were pilot tested with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people so we have tried to involve Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people throughout every step of the process of developing that module and we're going to be doing the same for the reporting of that as well, um, which is why we want a longer timeline. We want to make sure that there is adequate consultation and um, collaboration with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the release of that. And in terms of data sovereignty, um, we won't be releasing um, who, it, who identifies as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, or not so that that variable will be removed from the data set so that it is not accessible when the data is is put onto the data archives um, so yeah we will continue to work with our Torres Strait Islander um, uh, our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities to go about that the best way we can. Great uh, there's a good question here on how women and gender diverse people always lead the conversation. We know what our lived experiences are. How can we get cis men more involved in the conversation? Kristen. Uh, that's the easy question, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, Look, I, you know, I'm optimistically hopeful that as I, as we work increasingly with young people, I hear the conversations shifting and changing. And I think a lot of that has to do with the, as the respectful relationship um, curriculum sort of goes through the school system and you and people start to feel more comfortable talking about gender equality and violence and respect, that the conversations in the relationships are also changing. And 
Um, so I think that um, I th I'm hoping that we will start to see that through, you know, in the next sort of five to ten years. Of course, we'd like to see it happening immediately. Um, I, but I also think there's a there we do as women in, in this space have a responsibility to also open up the door mm -hmm. to in, you know allow and invite men in and I know there are some men who do work in the space and would or would like to work in the space um, and have found it can be challenging in, in, in you know in some in some ways so I, th I think there's that balance that we probably haven't always um, uh, uh, what, tread, we haven't tread quite well sometimes through the century of allowing people in and allowing that conversation to evolve. So I think there's yeah both hopeful, hopeful, but um, we could do more to let them in. Yeah, and I think the NCAS actually is a great conversation starter. Um, it's something that people understand because they understand their they understand the concept of attitudes and their understanding. So it might be uh, what I've been saying is we need to be having these conversations that are dinner tables at our local communities. So that's a way of bringing all genders in um, and, and ensuring that we're all having a common understanding and a common goal to ending violence against women. Eloise, do you want to add to that? I think that was said really well. Yeah, look, I think that was said really well. I think that um, sometimes it can be useful to really specifically articulate the ways in which uh, really rigid gender binaries and um, misogyny harm men as well. And some of the man box work there is really, and that's not yeah. about decentering the experiences of women and gender diverse people, but I think it's another really important framing that we can bring to the table. Um, yeah, as Kristen said, like being really explicit that we want you to take some of the space. We want a little bit of a break. Please do take up this. You know, I have been in meetings where, bless them, a couple of the amazing men in this space have been like, oh, I'll let I'll let all the women answer first. And it's, like, it's okay. You know, I want to hear from you. There's a reason you're in the room. So making sure that people know, you know, those spaces where it's so helpful to have allies in the work, being really explicit about those. And if I'm being a bit cheeky, you know, increasing the pay in the sector. I think something we hear <laughs> in particularly men's behaviour change sector that that I've heard from um, some sector colleagues is it's really tricky to get um, men into the work, not because they aren't interested in the work, but because you know we are, we are in a female dominated, comparatively underpaid sector. And so even just increasing those kind of working conditions and rights can actually help um, bring men into the space as well and benefit all of us, of course. Yeah, and there's a really good question here about whether there's, um, whether we could, whether ANROS could work with, uh, Jesuit Social Services to undertake a comparative analysis of NCAS and Manbox. And I know that Manbox did come to us to uh, look at how we've done um, some of the NCAS demographics. So yes, another potential project that's come out of the webinar. Um, uh, Nikki, on how the NCAS was conducted. When I read some of the questions, I wonder to what extent people are likely to provide the answer they may perceive is expected, the socially acceptable answer, even if they don't fully really believe or support the answer. That's a big question. Yeah, yeah. I think that, that social desirability is always a risk in surveys and to some extent it may be a greater risk with telephone surveys as this one was done by telephone because you've got another person on the line and you want to look okay. Um, we did do what we could to try to minimise that um, just by making sure that um, people understood that this is your opinion and we're not going to judge you and basically any answer is fine. Um, so, and the telephone operators, um, the people asking the survey were he heavily trained in this area to make sure that they weren't sounding judgmental or anything like that. And it was repeated quite frequently that, you know, we just want your honest opinion. Um, despite all of those, there is always a possibility that some people are going to be answering in the socially desirable manner. Um, which so what that what effect that would have is that our results may be an underestimate of the problems <laughs> um underestimating yeah how many people are, are holding those um problematic attitudes yeah. Kristen, you've worked with lots and lots and lots of different surveys how would you answer that yeah so i it, and it is 
I think that's the, that's the key message. What Nikki just said there at the end is that all of these report, all this data and measurement of violence against women is always going to be an under report. And mm -hmm. so we 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 can't stop doing the work until we even when we have a hundred percent. There's probably going to be some in the community. Um, so this is maybe a best case scenario. Um, I'll also mention that in 2017 we did do some testing of social desirability, and we found that. The, the the measures that are commonly used didn't show any particular social desirability that wouldn't be normal social desirability. So I think we can feel pretty confident that the, the questions are no more or less, are being responded to no more or less in a socially desirable way than another, any other survey would be. Um, and I also, I think that that's why it's important you look at, in some of the scales, you look at the extremes. So those that who strongly agree are probably, that's probably where they sit. Those who are sort of somewhat agreeing might be on the fence and they might be giving a socially desirable response. So they're equally important to look at that percentage. Who, who what is that group? They're not quite in the strongly agree. They're sort of sitting there on the fence. So there's something else going on that doesn't quite convince them. So, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Um, for Eloise, are there some better ways we can talk about non-binary folk without framing non-binary identity as a third gender binary in research? Yes, and I think you know it's a really, really important question because as I think, you know, if you read the body of the report, it does a really beautiful job of explaining non-binary as an umbrella term. Um, so it isn't, it's not a gender that people identify with and I think we, you know, we can get into some trickiness in terms of, uh, as you said, sort of treating non-binary people as a, a third gender rather than an umbrella. And I think, you know, it's one of those tricky linguistic things to a point, uh, I think really clearly articulating who, you know, maybe some of the other identities that are within that umbrella, naming some of those at times, um, the more and more people that we can survey, the more we can potentially kind of look at that. And yeah, just being really critical as well about how we're using the term and are we avoiding and I don't think this is an issue with NCAS specifically, but are we avoiding this idea of having to really break down our rigid ideas about gender and you know even its value as a category by just being like, oh, we'll just add this third one in and then we can, we're done. We don't have to have these tricky conversations about gender. So I think you know continuing to question the language we're using and the ways we're reporting uh, is the way forward with that. And it's absolutely an ongoing conversation that really you know non-binary people and tra other trans people rather than me need to be at the center of those conversations. Great, thank you. For Caroline, Caroline, sorry, how can we address tech facilitated abuse in primary prevention more? And I guess this is a good question when we've got research that shows dating apps, for example, three out of four people experience violence on the platform. That's what the Institute of Criminology is telling us. So there is a lot of abuse in that on that in that platform. What do we do in terms of primary prevention? Gosh, um, a big question. Um, I suppose, well, for us, it's going to be a learning experience running this new community grants program, and that's going to help us understand a bit more about um, what the issues people are grappling with out in communities and trying to change attitudes and behaviours. I think our, a lot of our focus in so the eSafety Women team has been um, focused on frontline workers. Um, a large part of that is because we recognise that, um, especially as that ramped up during the, the pandemic, we don't always have the expertise or the resources to support women who are directly experiencing tech facilitated abuse. Um, but primary prevention or more work in the prevention space is definitely on our agenda. Um, we are doing some work. I mean, I think I mentioned before, the safety by design is the work in terms of industry um, and major organisations and making sure that they build in safety into their systems and their technology um, to avoid tech facilitated harm in those forms. We were also um, very early stages of commissioning some research to help us understand how we might work with men and boys. Um, we touched on that issue before um, and give us some ideas about where we can um, work uh, to do that prevention. But I think one thing uh, eSafety is very aware of is that we're a relatively small organisation and so uh, 
our effectiveness really depends on, on partnerships, working with other organisations that are in this field and in this sector and passionate about preventing gender-based violence, that we need to be working with with others and, and other sectors to ensure that they're fully informed about tech facilitated abuse and the ways that it could be prevented and responded to um, so that it's not it's not all about us doing that prevention but that we're working with with the whole community to do that yeah and i guess in the context of dating apps you know that the platforms themselves do have some responsibility they're using yes. ai to look for you know uh, images that might offend they could be using um, AI not just to find perpetrators but also to be sending positive messages about what affirmative consent looks like or what people should be looking out for so doing that prevention work as part of providing the platform there's a couple of questions here which are similar which basically say when we know one in five um, and one in four women have experienced violence do we need to consider in the NCAS that people who show advanced understandings might be victim survivors? Nikki, I'm going to throw um, to you next, Kristen. Yeah, so definitely people responding to our survey are probably coming from all walks. And there's definitely, we would expect that there would be quite a few survivors responding as well as potentially perpetrators. Um, so obviously that is not something that we measure in the survey, but it's definitely something that we need to be aware of in terms of, and I think that um, a lot of these attitudes can be harmful for um, victims and survivors in terms of the self-blame as well as as well as what other people might think of them it's whether they might not tell anyone that they're a victim or survivor because they hold some of these attitudes and they subscribe to them and so they blame themselves yeah. and so i think i think definitely it is um something to consider and it's important to have all the um you know the help lines and the support services visible to people uh, participating um, but yeah absolutely it's definitely important to consider how these attitudes impact people when they hold them as as well as when other people hold them did that answer the question oh, really well um, <laughs> Kristen <laughs> Yeah, just to add a little bit, you know, just to reinforce Nikki, what Nikki said, in in other countries in the region, we do prevalence surveys measuring the experience of violence and we have a small attitudes scale. It's a much more crude measure than what we have in the NCAS. But what we do find is that women who experience violence are just as likely to hold harmful attitudes as women who have not experienced violence. And part of this is this internalization and sometimes it's part of the the culture of violence in the community. And so I think that's why it's, it's really important to be measuring what are the attitudes, knowledge and understanding in the community because it can prevent women from recognizing their own situation, prevent them from seeking help and, and can be a barrier to other people offering help and, and then continuing to blame the victim. So, um, yeah, so the, sure, the, the one in five women who've experienced violence you're going to have one in five of your survey respondents who will be experiencing violence, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to hold more positive or more negative attitudes. You'll have a, a cross spectrum. Thanks. There's a broader question, a couple of questions here on whether there's any future work planned on either secondary analysis of NCAS with men or more broadly more work on men. And, Kristen, I'm sorry to jump to you again, but I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about the perpetration studies that have that have happened in the region, because one of the things that Anne Rose is doing at the moment is developing our national research agenda. And a very strong theme that's coming through is that there's more work that needs to be done on men who use violence. Sure. So um I and Mm. Uh, with the perpetration surveys that have been done and globally there's a there's a um, a review of perpetration surveys and how you ask questions about men you ask questions mm -hmm. of men about the violence they perpetrate and about the violence they experience 
And there's, I guess there's two um, contentious points of view that some say that we need to ask questions the same way of men and women so you can have an equivalent comparison, which is what we do in the Australian Personal Safety Survey. We ask exactly the same questions of women and men. But in other regions, they argue that the violence that men experience is different, so the questions should also be different. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not necessarily convinced one way or the other. I think it's the way that we also ask questions about the way that that violence impacts on a person. Mm -hmm. So when we ask questions about, we can understand severity, risk, um, and fear, and harm, that we can then get a sense of, of how that impacts, you know, when it's a gendered violence. So as I said at the beginning of the PSS, men and women in Australia experience violence in similar proportions. But when you break it down into what it looks like and the, the, the fear and the harm that it causes, it's very different. So, um, so I think there can be a lot more that's done to understand the way that men think about their actions and how they are facilitating or perpetrating violence. And um, well, maybe I'll just reflect on one one survey that we did do where we we measured victimization and perpetration amongst women and men and the difference in the way that women responded to questions about perpetration they would often circle yes i think i've done that once or twice or yes i've done that or oh yeah in that relationship but the man would draw a whole lot, a line through the whole page saying oh i've never done any of this so <laughs> it's a really difficult um survey you know, it's not maybe not suitable for a survey to do this yeah. in-depth um research into what men's perpetration of violence looks like or it has to be a very nuanced and um yeah. Uh, you know, it, 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 we, we need to put a lot more work into how we do it, uh, thinking yeah, about it. It's probably yeah. far too complex for this <laughs> couple of minutes. It's far too complex, yes. And, and just just um, noting that we, we will be doing more work on men who use violence. What form that takes, we're still um, co-designing with people with lived experience, researchers um, from and, and practitioners. Uh, there's a really lovely final question, I think, that we could all reflect on. Firstly, thank you all for your work, and that's to the panellists. I'm curious about the panel's opinions on the media perception of gender-based violence, how that informs the wider public, and how these harmful attitudes can affect victim survivors. Are there guidelines for media reporting on things like gendered violence in the same way as there are school curriculum standards? If not, can there be? I know Anne Rose did have some guidelines a while back and we were thinking about using the NCAS to bring together media organisations to refresh those guidelines because clearly the media shapes attitudes. But I might throw to Carolyn, what would you say the media's role is in shaping these attitudes and in um, tech facilitated abuse in particular? Yes. Oh, well, I think like all of the community, we um, the media has a role. Uh, I think we definitely a safety tries when in responding to media inquiries um, and opportunities to include statistics like from the NCAS or PSS or from our own research to try and paint that that clear picture of the issues that we're, we're dealing with and try and address some of those myths and and misconceptions. So I, that's an effort. That we make all the time um, but I think yes uh, some guidelines would be quite useful for that. I believe, um, I believe yeah. Power Watch has, has released guidelines uh, for media, I have seen those and I think that was relatively recently. Um, yeah so there's also that yeah, and the, the positive, I guess, uh, from all of the coverage, and we have had a lot of coverage of the NCAS, which in itself is a great thing. Um, I was really surprised that there hasn't been misreporting of it. There hasn't been the going to the, you know, the, um, the, the, the figures that have small responses to say, look, we, we don't have a problem here, or to distort it in any way. So, it's nice to see that the media, by and large, has reported what we found. Um, so, but I think there's a there's a long way to go in terms of bringing them along in the journey, getting them to report on violence against women um, mm -hmm. and its uh, severity. And I think until we get that, we're not going to have a community understanding of um, the prevalence and the 
and the um, fear that lots of women and children live in. Um, I might wrap it up at that. Thank you all so much. It's been a really rich conversation. Um, and thank you, Nikki, for summarising a really complex report in, in such a beautifully simple way. Um, we will be, there was a question around qualitative um, work and we, we will be doing that after the sub-reports. Um, the webinar recording will be available on the website, um, as I said before. Please tell your colleagues, tell them how fabulous this panel was. Um, uh, webinar not to be missed as you exit. There'll be a short feedback survey. Please try and fill it in. Um, and for any researchers tuning in today, if you're working on projects addressing violence against women, you can submit your project to Anne Rose's Register of Active Research um, on our website. It's publicly, it's a publicly available database, but it's only as good as the researchers who input into it. So we'd ask you to um, submit your work there. So thanks everyone for tuning in. Um, it's been a lovely discussion. Um, spread the word. Um, I'm Padma Raman. Bye for now. Thank you.